Andy Revkin covers the environment for the New York Times, and this fall he's launched Dot Earth, a blog devoted to sustainability on the planet. And I think it's interesting how you frame it, not necessarily as a environment, global warming blog, but specifically you say there are going to be 9 billion people on the planet by 2050. How are we going to support them? How are we going to balance uh, the needs of the people and the fragility of the planet? I wonder if you could frame the discussion of sustainability as what you see as the handful of most important issues in this almost endless list of important issues. Sure. Well, I frame, even in my regular print reporting, I've, everyone has a to-do list and has priorities. And I, over the years, in covering the environment for now 20 years for the Times and then other places before that, I focus on stories with big ramifications. In other words, where are there irreversibilities in the system? And climate change is one of those things. You can't easily turn the knob back. It's, it's a, basically the planet, this greenhouse blanket on the planet is like a one-way thermostat. And biodiversity, losing biodiversity, losing the diversity of species on the planet, extinction is forever, for the moment. I think, I don't know if it was on your blog or somewhere else, and correct me if I misread or misremember this, but that no matter what we do, we would see no difference in the next 20 years. Yeah, one of the sort of darker conclusions of the, the big intergovernmental climate panel that, that came out early this year that I wrote about was that just that, that if we all jumped in Hummers and drove in circles and jerked up the thermostats, or if, or if we sat like the Buddha and didn't use any fossil fuels, the climate system, which is this huge bank of energy and stuff, has so much momentum it won't notice for 20 years. So that, that, that adds a, a horrible, politically inconvenient time scale to this problem because you can't sort of cut a ribbon, fix it, and then get reelected based on that, that really smart choice you made. Right. I guess maybe you can position it in a way that, oh, my bold choices show some sort of leadership. We, we spent like this part of the discussion kind of working on the premise that global warming is real. It is caused by man. We can do something to reverse it. How much of that is a premise in the scientific community? Is it the position of, say, the Times, for instance, that set of things are true? When you say the position of the paper is reflected in our editorial pages, meaning you know the ones that tell you what to do about something. Well, sure. Well, um, but I, th I think we can not cut it quite so cute because yeah, sure. as a reporter, do you feel an obligation to give equal time to people that say global warming has nothing to do with man, or are we uh, past that point? Uh, we're past that point because there isn't anyone with any authority saying that at this point. There are scientists who still question how dangerous it is right. or whether this human influence on the climate system matters enough to work on those, to put the priority on the long-term things, like cutting greenhouse gases, as well, opposed to adapting to the, the climate extremes, that kind of thing. And there's a vocal minority that says it's not real. When I was at the Live Earth concert at Giant Stadium, yeah. there's a plane overhead directing people to a website that outlines yeah. reasons they think climate change is a hoax, and that it is yeah. a, an effort from some yeah. to over-regulate, to over-tax. I've to, blogged on this point yeah. just the last few days, and I've been kind of attacked from all sides yeah. <laughs> for doing that. The, right. the, uh, they're, um, yeah, I mean, you can find any kind of opinion on anything if you look hard enough. There are people out there who are very working really hard to make everyone doubt that this is a problem. There's a, there's a tiny subset of that who say it's all fiction. Um, and they do get airtime. They, they don't get my attention because they're not publishing in the peer-reviewed literature. You know, I, I focus, when I'm talking about sea ice in the Arctic, which I write about a lot, because I've been up there a lot, um, I talk to people who are studying it. I don't talk to lobbyists yeah. from an environmental group or from a coal company. You know, I, I focus, when I'm writing about the science, I talk to the scientists. When I'm writing about what to do about it, you know, how, how we should respond as a society, I cast a wider net. And you know, a libertarian group, an oil company, and an environmental group all are part of that legitimate matrix of views on the sort of legislation or, or attacks, that kind of thing. Those are two different kinds of stories. So as a reporter, what is, I know there is no consensus, but wh where are we in terms of how big of a problem it is, yeah. how much we're responsible. I, I can't find anyone who's really immersed in this deeply who doesn't see it as a profound challenge. How do we limit this long-term buildup of gases that will last centuries, that will erode ice sheets, not just in our time, but for generations to come? That will mean that there'll be no new sea level. There'll be no new sort of normal sea level. Every century we'll have a new sea level. Yeah. Whether it's one foot, two foot, three foot feet is almost a red herring from the bigger 
reality, which is we're talking about no new normal anymore. That is a big deal, and, it, and that requires a concerted effort to change things. And that it, it won't happen magically. It requires new ideas, new technologies. It also probably requires a cap, a tax. So there's still, the atmosphere is a free dump right now. For The Hudson River is not a free dump anymore. The oceans, for the most part, you, you, you can pay a penalty if you dump something in it. There's a treaty related to ocean dumping. But there isn't a treaty related to atmosphere dumping that has any teeth to it right now. And so that, that's needed too. It's carrots, sticks, technology. And, and it's, that's why it keeps going back to that sort of um, the leadership question. A lot of the people I've talked to about this for a long time say we need to have someone step forward and say this is the grand challenge of our time. The closest we've seen to it, and maybe he's totally done it, would be Al Gore. Yes, he's changed his message a little bit. He's been so focused on describing the problem that he's, a lot of people criticized him for glossing over the solution side. Right. It's not as easy as it was made to seem in the movie. In fact, I, I quoted him when, in the film, he essentially says, we have everything we need to solve this problem. Uh, after the film came out, his speeches were much more nuanced. There was, we have everything we need to get started on this problem. And that's a big difference. Um, and it illustrates you know, why it's hard politically. Yeah. yeah, what were the problems with inconvenient truth? Well, we've written a number of stories about that. Um, in one piece I did when the film was coming out, I described it as, a, I think I used the word lawyerly. You know, it's, a, it's you choose and amplify the, the things that make your point. You have an agenda, and you want that agenda to be convincing. So there's imagery that makes your point. Just like if you're a prosecuting attorney, you're going to show the pictures of the bloody glove, and, and you're going to really show them blown up, amplified, and to make your, your point. Um, so it's, it is a polemic. It's the science that's in it. There's a few little details that are probably off this, but it's the portrayal of the science that gives that sense that some people have criticized as being uh, you know, overly toward the scary, the dramatic, when in fact the problem is more nuanced than that. A lot of people say if you try to impose concern on people, they, they recoil. If someone tells them to be worried, as Time Magazine tried to do last year, the big mm -hmm. cover, the polar bear cover? Yeah, uh, many people recoil from that and just say this is, this is someone trying to sell me something. And, and the reality of this problem is more complicated. I've written, uh, I've been to the Arctic three times, written a lot about sea ice. This last summer was an amazing retreat of the sea ice. And it's not as simple as just saying it's all melting, we've passed a tipping point. Many of the experts I've talked to <coughs> say there's, there's these big variabilities up there we're only just starting to get to, attuned to. So if you make your whole message that it's a real-time catastrophe now because of things we see in the world around us, and nature kicks back, let's say, for a few years, and the Arctic sea ice grows for a while, even though the long-term warming trend is heading toward an open ocean up there in summers, if you have that kickback and it gets icier for a while, then your whole argument that it's a real-time emergency gets eroded. Mm -hmm. And how do you sell your, how do you keep selling catastrophe if it's, uh, the process is more nuanced than that?